we just want to welcome everyone and thank you for showing up what you know uh, what a great opportunity from the conference to be able to then um, come in here specifically talking about how we uh, start to have better wealth habits god's ways and um, you know matthew and i are really really encouraged by that and and it's great having pastor john and pa papa luke and uh, uh, pastor bruce on as well uh, because I, I know all of you enjoyed the conference, right? It was a great, great opportunity and great time. Uh, it was our first online, so it was a great opportunity to test out and see how that worked. Um, and I really, you know, today we just want to cover, Matthew and I are going to take a session each. Um, we're going to cover some things, some habits. Uh, it's, it is being recorded. There'll be some slides as well. Um, so I recommend that if you're one who takes a lot of notes, don't. Just absorb. And if you want to doesn't take any notes, take a few, right? Because try and do the opposite of what you tr traditionally do, because what I sense can happen always is if we do the same things over and over again, uh, expecting a different result is what we define as insanity. So if you're one who takes lots of notes, lots of photos and says, I'll store it up for later, you'll never look at it again. So just absorb what's being said and lo look at what's one thing I can do to change things. And this is a real, it is a test for you because it's a changing of habit, which is something that we will connect you with. If you want to do things God's way, it means that it wasn't that you didn't want to do things God's way in the first place. It just that means you had some bad habits that needed to be changed. If you're somebody who doesn't take any notes at all, just take a few because it'll help you retain in a different way. Okay, would that be okay with everyone? Give me a thumbs up if you're all okay with that. Yeah, that's great. And if your camera's not showing, you can just still do the reaction of a thumbs up like Bruce, Pastor Bruce did. Thank you. So I'm going to pass it on to Matthew right now. He's going to start us off and uh, then I will come back and do the second session. If you've got questions, please feel free to write them down in the chat box or write them on a piece of paper and then you can, there'll be question time that we can talk as, uh, work through as well. Matthew, over to you, bro. Thanks, Ruben. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, let me just give you that. I've already got it. <laughs> you do. Yeah. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes. Good. All right, again, once again, welcome everybody and uh, thank you for responding to our call for those who are interested in to know more about uh, create wealth creating habits. And uh, so this today, what we're going to do is just an introduction, just give you some flavor of uh, what wealth create habits are and uh, how you should go about it. And, uh, you know, so then, you know, so we, because we, you know, this is really a long subject uh, that takes a few sessions to really teach is an ongoing math subject. So, but we just want to give you a taste so that you can have a basic understanding of what is required, the mindset you require and the habit that you need to create to go in, to do some investment, to do investing. And that's what it's all about. So once again, thank you and uh, just enjoy. So this seminar again, it's just a, uh, is an introduction to wealth creation. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about stewardship, even though we covered some in the conference. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody was there at the conference, but it's still good to remind of each other, each of us, that's why stewardship is very important in order to really make, uh, to be able to achieve what you want in life. Uh, then we're going to touch briefly on the purpose of wealth. Uh, and then we're going to talk about steps to create wealth. So that's basically the four parts that I'm going to do. My, my, my presentation will take about 45 minutes. And then we'll just open up for some uh, questions. And then after that, uh, uh, Ruben will take over on his, for his session. Right. I think what's happening now, we, you know, there's uh, it's no brainer. Everybody is uh, going through some shock in this world. What's happened in the last, since January, uh, with the COVID-19. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a lot of people have uh, gone into anxiety, fear, uh, but what uh, really sort of uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I was surprised is that how ill prepared people were uh, in terms of having uh, some sort of a finance, you know, that they can actually sustain for at least six to nine months without having to worry about what's happening. So, but this is what we call emergency fund. So, not only that, I, you know, we we seeing people being uh, queuing. It's a uh, you know in Australia we have this what we call Centrelink where if you if you don't have a job, you can go and queue for for uh, welfare, some unemployment benefits. The government is also printing billions of dollars, hundred and sixty billion dollars to help the, uh, to boost the economy. In US they've printed 
two trillion dollars, I believe it is. Now all this is done with no uh, accountability. It's just printing money, right? So it is one day the next future generations have got to pay for this, and it is not fair for us to impose this on them. So this is why. If you have funds for yourself, you don't have to queue. You don't have to be a burden to the government, and you can actually uh, have all the time and peace to be able to support. Think through what what is your uh, next course of action. Even even if let's say this uh, pandemic goes through for another six months or whatever time, so there should be no fear. So this is a critical thing. This is a good example of stewardship. If you're ill prepared for this, you know the Bible is very clear because there will be other. Events will be happening in in the future. So again, are you going to go through the same process? So this is why it's a wake up call. What I call, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of the parable of the ten virgins, where five were prepared, five were not prepared. So we have to be the like the ten virg, five virgins were prepared for anything to have, whatever happens. We are ready for it. So we, there should be no fear, no surprises, and that's what it's what's happening. You know, in the US, in the last thirty years. They've hardly had salary increases. In fact, people are going backwards in their income. If they sell their house, you know, on average, most of them have no more than about ten to fifteen thousand dollars in savings. If you take away their house, and that's not a good place to be, if you, especially if you've been working all your life, and it's no different in Australia either, right? Because we we can just see by based on the responses we saw, a reaction to people who have been laid off, companies are laying off people, even businesses. They have some, even if they have the money. They're just laying off people, right? If we are a kingdom business, we should have the capacity or the liquidity to be able to sustain the business for at least twelve months. Even if these things happen, you can still keep your employees uh, on on salary for two three months to see how things go. So, should be no panic, okay? So, I'm sure it's happening in the rest of the world. We know that most of the countries where they cannot afford to print, uh, produce uh, produce stimulus packages, they're going to the World Bank or IMF for help. European Union just printing 500 billion euros, uh, so it's just it's just getting crazy, getting out of control, right? So what do we do in these circumstances, right? We need to wake up, we need to learn to understand that we have a responsibility to take control of our lives, our family, and we cannot just leave it to others. We cannot leave it to the government. We cannot leave it to somebody else. And that's what it's all about. One of the reasons why you create wealth is so that you have that peace of mind. You have something to support your family, and 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 for and for you to look after yourself for the future. There's no guarantee. Even if they have ten million dollars tomorrow, we don't know whether that's be enough. But the point is, you got to make an effort to do something. If you don't do anything, then you're going to be worse off than somebody who's already got accumulated some wealth. <coughs> Excuse me. So. Wealth creation should be like an ATM. This is not the anti-time machine. I'm, I'll come to that later. This is the actual ATM, right? Where you, whenever you want money, you can actually go and take it. But again, that's not the free money. It's your money. You have actually deposited in a in a bank or some uh, financial institution, and that money is available to you. So you have earned it, and it's you have kept it there so that you can take it out whenever you want. But Well, only if there is money there for you can take it. If there's no money, you don't have money in your account. There's nothing there left, right? You go there, you're not going to get any money out of it. So our our so what you need to do is you got to look at the back of the ATM. You need to be in a position to replenish. Not only replenish, but to you know have more than what you need in the in the, in the in this ATM. Right. So what you know, I used to market ATMs uh, to banks, so I understand how ATM works. Right, so these are basically this is the computer that controls the actually the you know the software that controls all the dispensing mechanism. Uh, sorry, these are the cartridges. They got different denominations. Like this could be like ten dollars, fifty dollars, hundred dollars. So up to the car, you know. So each car each cartridge can have one different uh, denomination. So if you let's say if you want two uh, hundred dollars, you can say okay, I, I want two fifty dollar notes and one five fifty hundred dollar notes. So you pick two from the fifty and one from the hundred dollars. Right now, so this is why your ATM, you your your mindset, and the way you create wealth should be like the ATMs, right? So you must always have cash replenished, replenished and topped up in the in the ATM, so that there is no lack, there is no surprises for you, and there's an, always an overflow, 
right? Even if apart from your own needs, if you need to bless somebody, you can just take it and give it away. That's the kind of mindset we need. We need to think like an ATM that you should always have unlimited supply of money there and then you can use it for whatever purposes that you feel like you need. So that's a mindset that we need to have. Remember, you should be like an ATM that the money is always good. I'm always stopping it up. I'm replenishing it. I have no shortage of income. Whatever I want to use it for, it is there for me to use it. And that's what basically we need to look at from, from wealth creation point of view. Right? So it, again, as I said at the conference on Saturday, it's only through good stewardship. If you're not a good steward, again, as I said, God, God has created all of us. Uh, but if he doesn't, you know, if you're not a good steward, he cannot trust you. He cannot give you more. Simple as that. Okay. So we need to be a good stewards. And the Bible is very strong on the stewardship. There are so many parables and messages about stewardship. I even talked about, you know, there are 2,500 verses about, about money. Jesus himself spent 15 minutes, 15% 15 of his time talking about money. So it's all down to character. If your character is right with God, that means you're stewarding every aspect of your life. And wealth, and, and again, as I said, money is the center of everything that we need, that we need to do in our life. So we cannot ignore that. And it's a way of life. It's, you know, stewardship is a way of life. It is not something that is just, uh, you can, you just do it for a moment. But the day of the moment you wake up in the morning, the time you go to bed, uh, that's, you know, we should be always good stewards in every aspect in our, our job, our business, our family, our spouses, our children, our finances, everything, our health and so on. Right? As I said, there are seven, seven areas that we need to address. So what is stewardship? Stewardship, a steward's primary goal is to be found faithful by his master as a steward uses his, the master's resources to accomplish the task delegated to him. Right? Again, if I'm just quoting an, an example here, 1 Corinthians 4, 2. Right? So a stewardship is about God is giving you something and if you, you, it's in your best interest to do the best you can with it, right? If, for example, I mentioned the example of what the, the parable of the, one, uh, the servant with one talent, when he hit the money, the, 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 the master was so angry when he returned, this, you know, as what Bruce said, he did not uh, punish him and cast him into hell, but he was angry with his conduct because he was supposed to. Why? If, assuming he had given $1,000 to the servant and the master went away. When he came back, he expected, you know, the, the power, purchasing power of that money has gone down. So he, instead of 1000 it probably be only worth about $950, right? So that's why he was angry because it, the, he has lost the purchasing power and he had not used, you know, to keep abreast of inflation or, you know, or, and to put, and, and create a surplus or a, 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 a multiply that money. So that is why he was angry. So again, you know, we got his... Uh, you know, trusting us. He says, I'm giving you everything. You know, I finished the work on the, on the cross. I've finished the world, everything on the cross. And uh, God, you know, in Genesis, he says, you, we are to take dominion and multiply. If we don't multiply, then we can't any, blame anybody but ourselves. Okay. So I talked about the parable of talents. Now, why purpose of wealth? Right. The purpose of wealth is beyond just money and material possession. Right. People, the worldly system thinks of money well, differently than from us as kingdom, kingdom believers, right? For them, wealth, the first thing that comes is money. But for us, money is just one aspect of wealth. Our health, our, you know, everything else is part of wealth. I'd rather have good well, health so that I can always make an earning. I can make a living. If I'm sick and even if I have millions of dollars, uh, you know, if, and I'm, I'm in sick bed or dead bed or whatever is, is useless to me, right? So this is why we got to be very mindful of what wealth is all about. But money is certainly one of the ways to turn dreams into reality, right? It's a tool that we need to use and not to hoard, right? You either use it or it uses you. So you've got two choices, right? We have to use it as a tool. It is just, it. money is nothing more than just a means for us to achieving our goals and accomplish what we want, right? It's just the world system, worldly system believes in currencies, you know, money, they, they print money, they give you some dollar notes for, the, for, your, for your time that for, you know, when you're employment or when you do business, it's a means of exchange. So it's just a, it's a tool that is used to create wealth or to, do, to meet our needs. So again, we cannot hold it. If we hold it, if you become a servant to the money, 
but instead of we should be the other way around we use it to work for us and that's what that's the way it should be so kingdom wealth goes beyond material possession you know i'm teaching you this guys because this we all believers here if you're talking to a non believer i'm not even i'm not going to talk about kingdom wealth and so on i'll go straight to the point of money okay it also includes partial you know spiritual riches such as righteousness peace and joy so it's a package like what uh, uh, papa luke was saying on saturday you know if we seek first his kingdom and his and his righteousness so when you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness everything else is added to us our money our finances our health our peace joy wealth everything comes together as a package it's not separate it's not separated it's a package right it is our priority so then the definition of kingdom wealth is a, the abundance of material possessions and resources with righteousness right peace in the holy spirit and that's what it is so that so let for us we need to look at is a kingdom wealth is is seeking first the kingdom and its righteousness and everything will be added to it but in every in the center of all these things is money right without money you can't do anything which i explained in the in the wheel of life on saturday right so that is that is why we need money to be able to do all the things that we need to do for our family for our you know for and for for kingdom and and whatever that we need for our room our home our food on the table uh, how we bless uh, you know god's kingdom and so on so natural abundance without spiritual abundance is empty and useless okay so you need to understand that now let's look at how to get some financial breakthroughs i'm just this is where we really going to kick in into so this this the biblical part is over now now we're coming into the real world i talked about this uh, even on saturday the eight key actions you need to take right pay yourself first you got to start a habit of saving if you don't pay yourself first then you're going to be in trouble right manage your expenses by readjusting your lifestyle okay so if you if you feel you know if i'll talk i'll talk about some of the common areas where we make mistakes right build 3 to 6 months emergency fund in savings this is not borrowing it is money that you have saved and you put in a savings account or term deposit that is always accessible to you whenever you need this when i say emergency it could be whether you're laid off if you fall sick or whether you're unemployed whatever it is you have the money to sort of you know you're not under stress you're not anxious about how to uh, you know to take care of your your needs or your family needs how to put food on the table but that gives you a peace of mind that you can start planning okay now i'm in this situation i've got 6 months uh, money uh, emergency money available what do i do now how can i uh, work you know find an alternative solution how do I, how can i get out of the situation i am so you you know you have peace not worrying or panicking or freaking out and that's what it's all about right invest in yourself first that means putting your your family yourself your family if you don't have this is what we call your bread if you don't have bread you know you can't even give out to anybody else you can't be a blessing as i always say your blessing should be from the abundance not from the bread bread is always for you and your family right invest periodically with a long term mindset this is again is a discipline right investment is not a secret it's a it's a it's a science once you understand the science of how to invest it becomes easy it's about creating a habit right and i always talk about repetition creates mastery so if you keep on putting that in habit into practice in a matter of time you get used to it it becomes part of you so you got to create this mindset of long term uh, investment uh, mindset right invest in passive income with acceptable roi why do we say passive because the more you actively working on you know if you, let's say if you're an employee if you're working 9 to 5 and if you come back and do a part time job a part time business you're eating into your time a time that is normally you know should be reserved for your family right or something else or it also affects your health because you're just stressed out you you know all the time you're working 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 that's not the way it should be so what is so if you're working 9 to 5 you should have investments that you have uh, put into place that at the same time that 9 to 5 while you're earning maybe say $1000 that day in in your employment or in business as a salary there should be other uh, incomes coming in passive at the same time is multiplying the time so that that income comes in without you putting any effort into it 
right? No more than maybe 10, 10 you know, 15 minutes or 10 minutes and a day. That's all it should take you, right? So it's, it's a long-term strategy. Again, this is where you need to understand how this happens, right? Beware of negative impact of inflation. You know, again, I talked about this, uh, uh, how to be a good steward on Saturday, right? Inflation is the biggest enemy. It's a silent enemy for wealth creation, right? What you buy for $10 today, in five years time, it'll be worth maybe $15. So in five years time, your whatever is your value of your $10 must be worth at least $15 or more. Otherwise, you're going to go backwards. And we show you some examples uh, later where if you, you know, even if you, uh, if you don't factor inflation in, even if you have $100,000 in savings, and if you don't factor inflation, you just put in a savings account or anywhere that is going below, you know, the return is below inflation in 10 years time, that $100,000 will be probably worth $50,000, right? So it's a big danger. So you've got to be very, very careful how you, uh, you how do you in, in, uh, invest and uh, the steps that you need to take in terms of uh, uh, avoiding such pitfalls and dangers, okay? You've got to start now and let time do the compounding effects. So basically, you've got to plan backwards. You say, okay, I'm, I'm 25 years old today. Uh, by 50 years old, I want at least, say, $2 million. Right? I want to have $2 million by the time I'm 50, 20, in 25 years' time. Right? Even if you're an employee, you can do it. It's a matter of how do you, uh, understanding how to go about doing the investment. Right? So it, it doesn't matter. So that's why I always challenge people, even if somebody says, oh, I'm only an employee, I hardly got enough money to make ends meet, I can show you, you can. Right? It's about setting down, sitting down, coming up with a proper monthly budget. If you don't have a budget, you will definitely lose control of your finances. All right? And the budget must be very, very uh, practical. That means you don't cut corners to, you know, from especially don't cut corners on food, but there are other areas where you can save. If you're buying 10 coffees a day, you can probably cut back to five coffees. Put that five coffee money into your savings, right? It's an example, right? So there are many, many, many ways you can actually do that, right? If you're take, doing takeaway every day, say, no, why don't you cook? Right, things of so these are some of the examples that we can give you an essay. So, why most fail in achieving financial breakthroughs? Simple, they're not having the right set of beliefs. Most of them are fear based, well, because they don't, they the way we've been brought up in the family, especially as Christians, you know, sometimes our family, our parents have taught us being rich is bad, right? So, we create a fear of having money, right? That you know, that basically, or even the, the school teachers. So school teachers uh, don't teach us. You know, school education system is the worst. They train us to go to get a job. They don't teach us on financial stewardship. They don't teach us on entrepreneurship. So all these influences during our early days of childhood, right, impacts our, our subconscious mind. So that when we start growing older, and when you want to start investing, you you there is fear that you know because the fear goes back to your young uh, youth days of when you're young. Maybe your parents have uh, you know, been living in poverty. They've always been very tight with money. They say, they say, no, you can't have it. You know, we don't have it. We don't have it. So that mindset will always create a poverty mindset. Okay. So we need to come out of that mindset. Again, there are steps how you can actually shift your mind, your belief system from where you are to a, to the more po a positive area where you start believing that you're capable and you can transform, you can change. Right, we're not going to address all that here, but that is part of the training that, that we offer. Right, influences, as I say, like parents, teachers, the media. So, these are one of the main hindrances to our, our life. We've been, you know, we've been taught wrongly, and, and that's what happens when we're taught wrongly. Even I come from a very poor family, my parents were, you know, very, very poor, right? And I still remember that, you know, my when I my dad used to run a a small coffee shop, right? Even if I ask him for extra five, small, uh, five cents, he said, no, 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 you can't afford it. We can't afford it, you know? This is, you can't afford it, we can't afford it, right? So that 
sort of a, creates a, a, a mindset in you, whatever you want to buy, you feel, oh, I, I can't afford it. Or even if you want to buy, you say, mm, I buy something cheaper. You know, you like something, maybe it costs you a dollar, similar product, but you will probably settle for something which costs 50 cents, even though you can afford the one dollar. So the mindset, the poverty mindset always kicks in and says, no, you go for the cheaper alternative, right? So these are some of the examples that, that we need to break. Fear of failure, as I said, poverty mindset, ignorance of opportunities. We always think investing is very complicated, right? It takes too much time. You got to leave it to the experts, you know, the bankers or the uh, financial uh, planners and so on. No, the thing is again, that is because that's a belief we came with because they're bombarded with so many jargons that you, you, know, you just uh, feel that you're not capable. And remember, they are, they are also human beings just like us. If they can learn and do what they're doing, you are also in a position to do the same. Right? So there's nothing impossible for a human brain. It's a matter of understanding what are the opportunities there. You really dig, you do search, you will find there are tons of opportunities to make good passive income. And Ruben will be addressing what some of those options later as well. So beliefs are neither right or wrong, but you can change. Okay. So wealth habit mindset is a habit. You need to create that habit. If you don't create that habit, nothing will help you change you. Simple as that. You know, I, I, you know, I wish what I've learned in the last five years, I've known this uh, 10, even 10 years ago, because I've been running business for 30 years. Today, I could be probably 10 times or 15 times more wealthy than I was. But as I say, you know, I always say it's never too late. Whether you're 20, whether you're 40, whether you're 60, whether you're 80 years old, it is never too late. You know, Warren Buffett started investing when he was, I think, 15 years old. But he really started making the big money when he was 64 years old. Right? So he built it up progressively. Right? So it's never too late. You look at uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, the guy who launched a franchise for KFC, Colonel Saunders. He was in his late 70s before he launched his business, right? So age is no barrier. It's about your mindset, whether, when, whether you believe you can do it, you step into it, you can do it. It's a belief system. You've got to break that habit, right? So you need to change, number one, your identity, right? Like as Bruce was saying, your, your identity, who you are. Who has God called you to be? You know, are you a, have you got a slave mindset or a servant mindset, or you believe you're a son of God? Right? So identity is very important. With that wrong, wrong identity, you cannot uh, break through. Right? Second thing is your priority. Again, this comes to stewardship. Right? Once you understand your identity, what is my priority now? Where can, how can I step up and do what God wants me to be? You know, this is where I know I was talking about growing your capacity on Saturday, right? Growing your capacity means basically what from God's point of view is where, where you are now and the gap between where you are in and where God wants you to be, okay? So the gap where you are now, you may be here, God is expecting plan says, no, you, I want you to be here. So that's the gap. That's what the growing capacity means. So you can grow. We can never achieve the 100% of what God's plan is for us but we can only keep growing and growing because the more you grow, the more he's going to lift his, uh, you know, the expectation from you. So we have to be always focused, change our mindset, change our identity, who we are, believe that we can make, you know, we can create wealth, change our priority, right? Then the outcome you get is you start growing in capacity, right? So once you start growing capacity, right, then you are beginning to start trust. You be steward, good steward. God is now going to trust you with more, more, more accountability. He is going to give you more blessings, right? This is the way it works from the kingdom's perspective. Even the worldly system is the same thing. People change their mind. They believe, you know, they really work hard on changing their mindset. If you don't change your mindset, that's why I say I can teach you. Ruben and I can teach you all the knowledge about wealth building, wealth creation, how to do it. But if your mindset is wrong, if you still got the poverty mindset, and if you still got the fear and the servant mindset, nothing is going to happen. You're going to go to shift. You will like to, you'll just listen and you'll just go back to your old ways. Right? So you have to step out. 
from your comfort zone into what I call the faith zone. Believing God, that God is to say, you're my son, you have inheritance to all everything that I have. Things will start shifting. Right? So, is in is through investing why you get financial breakthrough because as I said, time is your enemy. Right? If you, if you don't use the same time to multiply and do multiple streams of income, you're going to go backwards. Right? Historically, now the interest rates are going lower and lower in the banks. Right? If some countries are even giving negative get negative interest. If you go to Japan, you know, you put hundred dollars, they they take uh, they charge you a fee as an interest. Right, so it's going backwards. Wage increase is lower than inflation. In Australia, for example, you know, on average, they get about two percent salary increase, two to three percent salary increase. But every year, the power bill goes up by more than five percent. Health insurance goes up by more than five percent. Right, education goes up by five percent. Your council rates, everything is more than five percent. So that is why a lot of Australian families are struggling getting more and more into debt because they're not keeping up in income is not keeping up with inflation. Right? So this is a major, major issue that people are, you know, this is a silent uh, trap that people are walking into. So how? So the only thing is you got to harness the power. Cost. So you got to step out and the only way you can start making money, even if you say, I can only save a thousand dollars a year, fine. Even if you can save 5,000, but if you do go into this power of compounding, which we'll show you in a little while, that $1,000 in 30 years could be worth a million dollars. Right? So you can't say, I, I don't have money. It's not the matter, no, you don't have money. You have the means, but you just don't know how. You, you, don't, you don't understand how to go forward and do it. So this is where we are here to help you. Yes, we can teach you how to do it. What are the options available to you? And then once you get into this knowledge, you can now start looking for what are the kind of investment I need to look for and, and how I need to create this kind of a wealth. Right? Inflation beating gains for long term. You must invest in something that is, if you say I want, okay, let's say if you want in your country, let's say in Malaysia, for example, if your inflation is maybe 3% a year, right? And if you put your money in, a, let's say, unit trust, and unit trust gives you 10%, 10, 10%, right? Number one, you have lost 3% from the 10%, it's becoming 7%. Then again, the unit trust company will charge you a fee, which is around 3 to 4%. So you have lost 7%, so you only have 3% growth, right? So this is where you people don't understand this, right? So you need to understand. If I go into some investment, what are the risks? What are the fees I've got to pay? You know, what is inflation? All this is going to be factored in. If you don't factor this in, then you, you know, you, you, you're going to be end up with surprises. And you cannot leave all your investment into third parties' hands. You've got to take control, even though you may invest with some funds or whatever, but you need to know how the fund is performing. Is it still doing well, or if they're going backwards, I had, you know I need to pull it out and put it somewhere else, right? So, for example, in uh, in Malaysia, of course, they got the EPF. EPF is now the the return is not as good as it used to be. It's going you know it's going lower and lower. But if you're only depending purely on your EPF for your retirement, you're in trouble, right? Because you might probably end up in let's say you you get five hundred thousand dollars in another 10 years time, right? But then you, your income has stopped, your salary has stopped, you're going to go backwards. And if you don't know how to manage that $500,000, you will squander that in no time because there'll be pressure from your family members. Oh, can I borrow this money? Can I borrow that money? And in no time it's gone, right? So you need to, that's what I do. For, I'm now at my age, I'm, well, I'm a, they call it the senior citizen in Australia, right? I'm 69 years old. But I feel like a 45 year old man anyway. So that's, you know, so bugger, whatever they say. So it's not in my mind, it's not in my heart. But at my age, it's my strategy is capital preservation. That means whatever capital I have, I don't touch it. I live off the profits. So I've, I've, I've invested in such a way that the profits that I get for every year, every month, supports me comfortably. Right? So I come to a point where I'm not looking at building, creating wealth anymore. I'm just, mine is, yes, some growth, 
but more mainly for profit to sustain me, right? But if, when you're younger, then you're, you're, you should be looking at growing a wealth. You say, okay, I'm 25 or 30 years old. I want to grow, uh, grow my wealth. So you should be in a different strategy. So at different age group, you've got different strategies on how you need to create wealth. Okay, so it's not one model fits everybody. Right, so the longer you wait, the more you need to put aside. So the earlier you start saving, investing, the lower you need to start with. Right, I talked about return on investment. If ROI is so critical. If, if you don't, your ROI should always exceed your fees and your cost of living inflation. Okay, so there are some, you know, basically there are two types of investments. I call it two categories. They are broadly classified as defensive and growth. So the defensive ones are like cash. You put cash in your bank account, savings account, fixed terms, bonds, corporate bonds. They, you know, they are giving you income, but they're not growing in value, right? If you put fixed deposit, I know, but Malaysia and Australia, you probably get about 2.5%, right? I don't use, I don't put any money in term deposit. I give it in a certain, you know, my seniors account for my emergency cash. It gives me about one, two percent. It doesn't matter because that is emergency cash. Whenever I need, I have access to that immediately. But all my other investments, which comes into here, these are growth investments such as shares, property, real estate, forex, management funds. You know, different different types of funds. For example, so these funds generate anywhere between seven percent to thirty percent. So you got to look at depending what kind of risk you want, what kind of return you want. Okay, so you need to have multiple portfolios of this. You know, you may have some are very safe investments, which will give you like, say, if you may go into shares or, you know, I, I personally don't go into shares because shares like now, you, this, you know, what happened recently with coronavirus, all the share markets have lost 25%, right? I go for managed funds. Managed funds is basically, they call it index funds. Index funds is where you don't do the they are managing, they invest in the top 300 companies or top 200 company shares, uh, top uh, listed companies in the country, and they are very solid. They will give you probably about seven, eight percent return. So that is reasonably safe. But then I, you know, you need to break it up into two or three buckets, I call it, categories. So that's a safe income. Then maybe one will give you slightly riskier, but will give you 15% or 10%. Then the slightly or medium to high risk, which will give you 30%. So combined, you'll start getting about maybe 20% return. Right, where right, right now. So again, just just an example. So it depends on your own strategy. What is it that you want to achieve? Does that make sense? Right. So the formula is basically time factor plus cumulative capital equals critical mass. So time is something you need to have. You need to look at long term, anywhere between ten to twenty, twenty five years, thirty years, and then cumulative capital where you start compounding, it will give you critical mass. I have an example, a couple of examples. One, uh, I was reading uh, about a guy in uh, 19, 20, 1914, 1924, right? He was working for a company called UPS in US as an employee, right? He was earning $12,000 a year. That's $1,000 a month, right? He diligently put, put away 15% of his income to buy shares in UPS, right? And by the time he retired 30 years later, he had $70 million. Asset, $70 million. And he's a guy who started with $12,000 in salary. Right? Even in 30 years, how much could have you earned as an employee? You could even if you earned $30,000, right? From $30,000 to $50 million is just you know, mind boggling. Why? Because he was consistent, patient, investing, long term investing is boring but you need to stick to the rules and play the game. You cannot chop and change, and then you start ending up with a problem. So success factor is about patience, consistency, and staying focused. If you start chopping and changing, somebody tells you, oh, that one is making money, this one is making money, you're shift, shifting your money around, you're going to be in trouble. Always do your homework. Make sure you know what you're going to go into. If you don't know, just because somebody is telling you, you don't do your homework, you don't do research, something happens, you cannot blame anybody. 
So you need to know, you need to know the risk. You need to know what you're getting into. Understand as much as possible on the product. As I said, you know, I ask most people about unit trust. I know in Malaysia, mutual fund is very popular, right? I ask them how much you know the fees are. They say, oh, I have no idea. Then they'll go and dig, dig, dig. They'll go and call the uh, uh, financial advisor. Hey, by the way, how much is the fee? Huh? Is it 4%? Wow, 4%, yes. So 4% plus your inflation, 3%, 7% is gone. So even if you get 10% or 11%, your net return is 4%, right? And if you start compounding 4% where it's supposed to 11%, you're going to be not where you need to be. So you need to do your homework. So this is an example. You know, I showed another compounding example on Saturday. This is just starting with $1,000 and you don't put any more capital, just $1,000, that's all. And here we are assuming a return of 30%. Okay, you say, well, oh, that's too high. It is not too high. We know it exists. This product exists. Okay, so you start with $1,000. You get $300 return. After one year, you get $1,300. In 10 years, you have achieved $13,788. Remember, it's only for $1,000 we invested. And it's passive. You don't do anything with it. You just keep an eye on it every week, maybe 10 minutes of your time to check on the, on this, on the investment. That's all. Now look at what happens in 30 years. That same $1,000 compounding at 30%, it becomes $2.6 million. So somebody starts a $1,000 investment at the age of 20, by the time they're 50, they got $2.6 million sitting there. Now you can, can you, are you telling me that you as an employee, you cannot create wealth? So that is, you know, it's about you going out there, understanding what is out there, getting to do some homework, do some research, and then you will, you know, you will start finding solutions. There's always opportunities out there. See, my my part, my 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 portfolio is I have some investments that gives me ten percent, some investment that gives me eight percent a year, some gives me twenty percent, some give me thirty percent, right? But then I combine. I, you know, overall, I'm getting over 20% return per, per, per year, right? That gives me enough for my monthly lifestyle. I've got a comfortable lifestyle. You know, I can, I can go for me, eat whatever I want. I can do travel. And last year, Ruben, myself, Papa Luke, Bruce, we traveled to over nearly 10 nations, right? We didn't ask for anybody's help. We didn't ask for offering. We didn't ask for tithes. We pay our own airfare. We just all cover all our expenses. If somebody blesses us, that's fine. We accept it. Right? We didn't ask anybody for any money. Right? That's the kind of thing that we need to be, you know, that's why it's what, what Ruben and I call, like, I like what Ruben says, it's called economic independence. That means whenever you need money, that is always provided for, that is always available. You're not stressed, you're not going to go into debts. Okay? Debts is another thing, we'll talk about it later. Okay, so this is just an example. Right? So if you have investments that are giving you, 10%, 20%, and 30% into three different types of investment, you average it out, you're going to get about almost 18 to 20% return. That's good. Then you see compounding it. Just take the interest, the profits, reinvest, reinvest, reinvest. Don't touch it. You must treat it like as though it's a money that is, doesn't exist. You just keep put it away. Don't even think about it. Don't even touch it. But of course, you know, if you're saying, oh, you know, after 25, 26 years, 25 years, I got one almost a million dollars. I may take some of that money and pay off my mortgage. That's fine, right? Or maybe I want to buy an investment property. That's fine because now you have cash to buy and you can still, you may not take all. You may say, I might take only half. I stick half and I leave the other half to run. So that is, keep, that is going to grow again, right? So it's about how you, your strategy, each person has got a different strategy that we need to work with. So I talked about on Saturday, six mistakes that we make, post stewardship. Avoid buying expensive things that you can't afford. Even if you can afford, if you don't need it, don't buy it. Especially depreciating assets. You know, how many of you buy phones every year? Why didn't you buy a phone every year, right? If this phone can easily last you three to four years without even, you know, with the functionality that's already there, 
This my phone. This phone is almost three and a half years old. I'm still very happy. It still serves my purpose. Right? Of course, you know, Ruben and I talk about he he believes in Apple. I believe in Android. So that's the difference. We we joke about it. Okay. But I I get the performance that I need. Everything it serves me well. Right? When you why do you need to buy a brand new car if you're an employee? If you're not a business owner. If you're a business owner, yes, you can write it off as a depreciating asset against your profits. But if you're an employee, why do you need to buy a new car? Buy a three-year-old car, you know, you still have warranty, right? You can save the money, the balance you save, you can put into investment. I got a friend who, through one of the funds that we invest in, he he could afford to buy a brand new car. But he said, no, Matthew, I'm not going. You know, he told me I didn't buy a brand new. I bought a brand new car, but I didn't pay the full amount. I didn't go into loan. I paid enough to deposit the balance of the money I had. I put it into this investment. The return I was getting from this investment was more than my repayment that I need to pay for the car. Right? So he was happy. He still was getting a positive cash flow out of that investment. Okay? So you got to think through anything to do with depreciating assets. How do I, what do I need? What is the minimum I need? Don't go and buy expensive things. Buy, invest in appreciating assets. Real estate is good. But again, location is all about location, location, location. Where you buy is important. What you do with it is important. Okay, Ruben is going to talk a little bit about that later on. So, give some ideas, right? So, always be very careful with because remember, it's God's money. God has given you that money. You need to steward it well. If you squander it, you're thinking it's your money. You can do as what you like. Then, you know, you are the loser. Nobody else is going to be the loser. You. Okay, living paycheck to paycheck. That's not a good example. If every month you're just depending on your salary to live on, you're in trouble. You know, 20 years old, I can understand when you do your first job. When you're 30 years old, you can't be doing the same thing. When you're doing 40 years old, you can't be doing the same thing. You're walking a very thin line, right? Do not have a monthly monetary budget. As I said, that's what monthly. Your monthly budget is very important. What do you want to spend? What do you want to invest? Right? So, like I like what Warren Buffett says. Warren Buffett says, right? Uh, I think what let me just recap what he said. It's very interesting. He says, uh, "Don't you know? Don't invest from your savings. Invest what you need for your savings and live on the rest." That's quite a good thing. In a totally different, opposite way of thinking. Okay. So we need to be very care conscious about it because we don't know how long we're going to live on this earth, my friend. The Bible says three score and ten, but you know you might never know. You know, do you want to live an inheritance for your family, right? You need to live something if you're married, you got children, education. We don't know, so it is our responsibility to have that kind of security around for our family as well, right? So become a real, don't become a real spender. Don't try to prove to your friends, oh, I can, you know, even though you don't have it, you can just go and spend it to show show off. Don't show off, right? If you go and show off, you are the loser. Nobody else is going to be the loser. And when you're in trouble, nobody's coming to help you out. The very friends will not come, be there to help you. Okay, so you need to be careful with your budget. That's why you need to have a budget. Don't abuse your credit cards. Don't buy, and then you know you can't afford to repay that that month. You got paying interest. Interest, you know, it's almost twenty percent interest on per annum on credit cards. You know, it's crazy to pay that kind of money. So this is why, uh, you know, we got what we call good credit and bad credit. Like a mortgage, again, if you take a mortgage, it's got to be something that you can well comfortably afford from your income. Don't overstretch yourself, right? Credit card is a bad, more bad, bad credit. Mortgage can be considered as a good credit provider you can afford. So a bad debt becomes is a debt that you cannot afford to repay. Okay, so there are good debts and bad debts. So you got to be mindful of that as well, right? And do not you do not have a financial plan. You don't have an investment plan. Okay, you're just coasting along uh, with aimlessly. That is not God's plan for you, right? So the key thing to road financial success is emergency fund first. Then you look at investment fund, and then you look at your portfolio. How where from there you can say, okay, where do I invest? What are the different buckets that I want to invest in, and then manage the risk. And keep it long term. You know, always talk to people who have good knowledge of investments, 
uh, get knowledge from them, speak to them, get them to give you some ideas and knowledge. Don't always go to your financial planner, somebody who's only interested in selling you mutual fund, right? Because they're getting commission to pay to pay us to ask you to invest in mutual fund. They don't care about your long-term return. So you got go and talk, get the right advice, where which is good for you, from neutral parties. We're going to give you a better advice than somebody who is just a financial planner who's really interested in selling life insurance to you or mutual fund of some sort because they get they're motivated by the commission. Right? It's your money. You need to take control. It's your future. So I hope, you know, that's just a very short uh, introduction because normally this is, a, you know, we're doing about, I think it's a six weeks uh, weekly training that we teach, you know, we're going deeper into each, each lesson, uh, the one, you know, that, we, that will take you to the point where you understand fully what investment is all about and how you can go about confidently doing it. So this is just an introduction. Uh, and thank you guys again for your time. Over to you, Ruben. Wonderful. Thank you, Matthew. I hope that was really helpful for you guys. Um, are there any questions or thoughts on what Matthew has shared? So I opened up for a few, about five, five, seven minutes. And, and there's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, we are talking stuff that the church should be teaching us. That isn't happening. So we know we really want to uh, encourage you that sometimes we don't know these things and we want to know more or we need to understand more. Um, so any questions, feel free to type or unmute and ask the question. So I guess a question would be, um, you, you said don't go to financial planner who's just trying to sell you mutual funds. And I understand that. Um, but where do you go for financial, uh, you know, for Look, investment? Advice? Yes, you can go. You can go to a financial planner, but just don't jump on what they're offering, right? You go and talk to a few financial planners uh, and find out what are the different options available to you. Then you start putting some some plan around yours. What you think you need to achieve in your life, right? So yes, mutual fund can be one of the products that you can look at as a portfolio, but if you know that it's giving you net after expenses and inflation only 4%, then you know that's not good enough for your long-term plan, right? So you need to add something else that gives you a higher return. For example, what we suggest, for example, what we do to people who, who, that we recommend, we say, don't put more than 15% of your, let's say if you got $100,000 to invest, right? Put We have to break it up into different buckets. Okay, I'm going to put uh, maybe 20% in a more safer investment, another 50, 50, then I spread up 15, 15, 15%. So the last 15, the more riskier, I'll put 15% of my, my total investment asset money that I got. So I put $15,000 there. So even if something goes happens there, I'm not losing all my money, right? So you need to spread it out. But again, you need to know what are the risks that's available there. I, I guess also uh, my thought, Matthew, on, on John's question, great question. I go back one step and I guess what I glean from what Matthew was saying is, do you know where your, what your money is doing? Because I know often we put, give money to people to manage for us. And it's really interesting. I was talking today to a, a man who's come from a banking industry for many years. And he, um, was, he, he, he was basically managing other people's money, millions of dollars, but he said he would never put his money into those very instruments. That's right. And when they asked why, he said, because the banks are doing it all for themselves, not to help the other person. Correct. So I guess- the so they, got, they, got to they got to satisfy the shareholders. Correct. Right? So they got to pay commission incentive to the various uh, people who are looking after the products and services. Right? So you are the least important to them. You, you get the crumbs. So the, the principle behind the question is, there's a better, um, a, another question that I would, I normally ask is, um, are you a student of your investments? Do you know where your money is going? I, you know, in Australia, we have something called superannuation. In America, it's called 401k. Um, we're, we're, we're blindly putting that money into some place that we have no idea 
what is happening to it. Whereas what we're suggesting is you need to start knowing. It's like giving money to the church. Now we have ministers, so we, we can kind of put this down. Um, when people say, I just give money to the pastor, I just give my tithes and my offerings, whatever he does or she does with it is up to them. No, it's not. We, there's a level of responsibility that we've got to take as individuals because we'll get upset when it doesn't work our way. It's the same thing with finances. I just put my money in something that I've been brought up in knowing, and then we get angry with the government and the systems when they don't work. But the fa fact is, it's your money. Um, are you learning to deal with it properly? Because God said and asked us to be good stewards of our income. So I would be asking that question and then looking at, you know, are these instruments and these vehicles that I'm putting my money in, is it actually doing what it's meant to be doing? And dig Yeah, and I think the basic things, you got to have a plan. You say, okay, what do you want to, you know, in 20 years time or 30 years time, what do I want? Let's say by the time I'm coming to retirement, right? I'm say by 50, 40, 50 years old or 55 years old, what is it that I want to have as wealth? Right. And then you work backwards. Then you really get an idea. Okay. I need to come, you know, have a compounding of 10% return or 15% return average to be able to meet that number with the starting capital that I'm putting in. So that way, you, you know, you, you, what we call the rule 77, if you know, rule 72, right? Our rule 72, it says, shows you how to double. Let's say if you want to double your money, uh, in, uh, let's say if you, if 72, let's say if you want to die, if you want a return of 10%, right? If you want a return of 10%, so you take the 72 divide by 10, you get 7.2. 7 so it takes you 7.2 years to double your money on a 10% return, right? So that rule, so you can start applying these rules that's available there to identify, okay, what is it that I need to do? How do I build my wealth up? What do I need to do now? That's why I put in my eight list, I said, always start from back backwards identify what you want to achieve then you work backwards where you are and what do i need to start with and then you start building forward towards where you want to be uh omar you had a question you had your hand raised i'm assuming you had a question please unmute yeah thank you so much sir and uh, i also want to appreciate um uh, Pastor Matu, for your time to prepare this lecture. Yeah, I want to understand more. You make, you show us a matrix of a power of compounding. Yep. So I want to understand one of the major challenge, personally to me, and I also observe to some other many investors, uh, the present world today looking at the economic situation. So people find it difficult. I find it difficult to identify those investments that can earn you a rule I, you know, uh, whatever, 20%, 30% within a period of time. So, and also the trust, how to bridge the trust on this previous investment in town. So we have so many out there. And uh, I, if possible, I'm pleading, if our lecturer can be able to assist us to identify one or two, show us one or two, at least we can start with. Thank you, sir. God bless. Oba, yeah, thank you for that. that uh, yeah, look, initially, as I said, the reason is a lot of people are ignorant of the opportunities available out there, right? Because we just don't, we are so engrossed with our job, our family. Uh, we think money, you know, we don't think about our future. Actually, a lot of people are scared to plan investment, long-term investment. They're scared. They just don't know how to start. Their fear is there. But if you really start doing some research, doing you get some good books on investing principles. You know, there are a lot of books out there teach you how to basic principles of investing. They teach you different compounding effects. You know, different instruments available. And then what it do is you, you, you see which you're comfortable with, then you go and look in your country or overseas, what are the products that's available uh, in your country? Or maybe if you can travel, if you can invest overseas, what are available? So that's how you, we all do research. We never, somebody, don't, you know, it just didn't come and land on our lap. We all have to do the research, right? But yeah, we are, we are more than happy to help you guys. We can talk to you, you know, about what some ideas, we can give you some ideas. We are more than happy to do that. Wonderful. Thank you. 
If there are any Thank other you. questions, um, we you know feel free to type them in because I want to just spend some time uh, giving you another just another aspect of Matthew and I have kind of like the end result being the same, but we all both came from come from different ways that things have worked in our lives to produce income. Um, so I, you know, hopefully that will encourage you. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I really thank God for. Pastor Matthew, even Papa Luke and, uh, and uh, Pastor Bruce is that it's very, very hard to find people who are both kings and priests, ministers and businessmen or women. And it's been so encouraging to meet others after so many years that not just talk about being in business and ministry, but actually doing it and doing it very uh, effectively as well. And I know that most of you here uh, have a sense that you're called for ministry as well. And if, if that's true, would you just put a one in your chat? Because I want to make sure we're talking to the right people that you just have a sense that there is something more than just being in this world, um, that there's a sense of ministry in you. You don't have, doesn't mean that you have to be a pastor behind the pulpit. It simply means that you want to reach the loss for Jesus, you, but you want to disciple people in a greater measure. You want to go, have God to use you um, in the giftings, uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And if that's you, would you just, you know, just put a one in, in, in the chat box? Because we just want to make sure we're on the right track. At the same time, so I've got six, six uh, ones, which I'm, I don't know what the other 20 are doing here, but <laughs> I've got seven. I'm a bit worried we, we, you guys are on the wrong one. <laughs> All right, we've got a few more happening now. All right. Um, and, and why I'm asking these questions, are one of the things that, that help us and why you're on this is because there's a need to transform, you see, and that's important. Um, oops, we've got Valerie accidentally sharing her screen. Let me just try and get you out. There you go. Thank you. Um, and uh, so it's really important because we want to get to a point. Don't worry. It happens all the time to all of us, Valerie. So you're not the first who's done that and you won't be the last. <laughs> so no problem at all. Um, why we're asking these questions is because heaven begins to change things in our lives when we prophetically make us an action. So thank you for those who've put the one and I do appreciate that because it, it actually means something. Sometimes people go, yeah, yeah, I just, uh, it is true, but I don't need to press. I know because I come from an Aussie culture, we get sometimes so lazy that we'll just nod our head and but we will not take action. And, and, and that's a really detriment to ourselves compared to some other cultures um, that, that, that I've been around that jump up and take action really fast. But the good thing with uh, our culture is when we do take action, we go the long haul and, and we see things actually reaping. We finish and try and complete the tasks that we, we put in our, our minds to, which is great. Um, so your call for ministry. My other question is, how many of you sense that you are, you are ready to be a king as well, not just a priest? And what the difference is, a priest hears from God, but a king actually takes the action, which is what I call wielding the sword. And if it's a yes, would you put a two in your chat box? Because um, you're choosing not just to be a, in ministry as a priest, but you're choosing to also be a king. And the Bible talks about being a royal priesthood. And too often the church has separated kings and priests, businessmen and women, or those who earn income separate to the ministers. Whereas the Bible doesn't separate them. The church, unfortunately, does. And I'm really sorry on, on the church's behalf that we've messed things up for a lot of years and decades. But hey, we're trying to put things right. At least the five of us, six of us here who are ministers are trying to put things right. Amen. Which is good. <clears throat> we're showing by example. So I've got a few of you, 11 of you that have said, uh, you know, 13 of you, great, that's half, um, that you're a king, not just a priest. What that means is that you're ready to hear from God and wield the sword, which means to do something. In the Old Testament, the priests never took action. They heard God. They spoke to the king on behalf of the priests, prophets, but it was a king that had to go and take action. Jesus was, was a king and a priest. So was David, so was Melchizedek, and so are we, which makes that uniqueness of us being able to do both and the expectation of heaven to do both, All right? So you've got 13 who say that they believe they're kings. Um, and I want you to think about that for those who are not sure of that, that you're ready to, to understand uh, what we call business in the kingdom and business for the kingdom. The value of a soul that none should perish, business in the kingdom, and ha being, having dominion over the wealth of this world, which includes money, business for the kingdom. 
Does that make sense? And, and so it's really important. It's really interesting. Matthew shared this, has shared this often, that Jesus spoke a lot about finances. Never about tithes, which is interesting. Only six times in the New Testament that there's tithes appear. Uh, four out of those six times are when he's telling off the Pharisees and it's taken from different gospels saying the same story. But there's, there's so many parables. I, I think it's like something like 60% of the parables are about business. Okay. And so it's really interesting for us to understand that because I actually believe Jesus was beyond wealth. Yep. He understood things way beyond wealth. And that's really exciting. So <clears throat> thank you for those who've responded. There's an importance in why we're doing that. Um, I want to share with you my perspective a little bit on, on uh, the journey of creating wealth and wealth habits. And unless you can't see this, if you can't see the screen, do let me know, but I'm assuming it looks like it's good and everyone can see it. So part of my journey was that when I was uh, growing up, I always grew up in a Christian background. My mom and dad uh, were believers when I was born and uh, always had a Christian background in me. I was 12 years old when I became a leader in the church. I was a, uh, a young man between the ages of 12 and 15 when I had multiple encounters with Jesus in my room. I'm not saying all of this to qualify myself and say I'm more special than you just because I asked and Jesus did. If you ask, he will too. Um, I, I was under 21 years of age when I bought my first property and it began to pay for itself. I was earning more money as a, as a uh, contractor than even my manager working in the bank. And I didn't actually know that any of this was creating wealth. I had no clue that I was actually doing fairly well. Um, and every year I'd buy about between one to three properties every year for about four years, just on ongoing. Um, and, and then got married. And uh, then year 2000, the bubble broke and I, and I lost my high paying contracting job. And uh, all of a sudden I had a huge mortgage on my hands and I had uh, th three children, two of whom were twins and I had no source of income and uh, a very high mortgage. And all of a sudden reality started hitting me that, um, you know, and this is why I've got this banner. If you can see my banner, it says, can my income produce without me? And uh, so I went through a journey from that day that was in 2000 over the next 20 years where I had to make some decisions. And one of the biggest decisions that I made and the best decision I made was I decided to become a student of investments. I started studying millionaires and I couldn't find Christians who were writing any books on it. So I went to the world and just found millionaires and started reading about millionaires. And I found that they had very similar habits. And guess what I found that everyone, because you gotta remember I grew up a believer. So I was extensively reading the Bible. By the time I was 24, I'd read the Bible cover to cover at least two or three times. Again, I'm not saying this to quali my, qualify myself above anyone. I'm saying this simply to put into perspective that um, I began to recognize that millionaires were using the scriptures and they were not believers. And they were, min min they were making more. And I don't know how, if you understand this, but the more you, the, the, as you start making more, you start producing even more. It's like a snowball effect. The more you make, the more you just keep having and the more you keep, it just, it snowballs. And so when people don't have, it's because of the change, the wrong attitude that they have, that they don't have a mentality that you can actually have. And millionaires began to, uh, in those days was a big thing. Now it's not being a millionaire. Anyone can, in your lifespan, each of you would have made a million dollars worth. If you work for about 40 years, even at a $30,000 salary. That's interesting. So we started looking at billionaires. Then I went back to the Bible and began to see that actually God uh, has a strategic plan in place. And it, Deuteronomy 8.18 says it is God's, it is God's uh, uh, that God has given us the power to create wealth. And so I began to realize that I was, that people either run away from money or they run towards money, but no one's making money their friend, as Luke chapter 19 says, make friends with mammon. So if you can be found trustworthy with mammon, you can be trust, found trustworthy with the things of heaven. So at the, around about the age of 30, I, I actually had a plan that by the, around about the age of 25, I said, actually, I had a plan that by the age of 30, I could retire into financial freedom, something that Matthew was talking about before. Um, and I had a, a exit plan was based around buying more property, um, getting the property to work for itself. 
Uh, it was it was work around making business work for me. Didn't know much about stocks at that time, um, and all of a sudden, got to thirty, nothing was happening. It wasn't going according to my plan. How many of you know you can make plans and then things don't go according to your plan, right? Um, and then suddenly, at about the age of uh, thirty-two or so, my whole world came crashing down, um, and uh, a divorce hit me that I didn't see coming, and and five children from a marriage and, and I lost everything. And I went into, uh, around the age of 34, I went into a, a crash of minus $200,000 in debt. Um, and I was quite, I, I actually believed I was quite a, a, an astute man in making sure I paid my debts and paid my responsibilities, et cetera. So it hit me quite hard. And that's when I discovered this key that Matthew talked about before called economic independence. And I want you to take note of that because I came to realize that I actually, and I retired at the age of 36 into economic independence, which is far better than financial freedom. The difference, financial freedom is money to do the things that I want to do. Economic independence is doing the things I want to do regardless of money. There's a big difference because many people say, if I can solve the money problem, I can do whatever I want to do. I can do whatever God's called me to do. I can live out my dreams, etc. And so then that's how the enemy gets a hold of you because it's a spirit of mammon. And economic independence is what, the key to everything else that you had to first recognize that you don't need money to do the things that God's called you to do. So I actually began to step out into ministry in a much greater way. I began to take faith steps in a bigger way, give more than I'd ever given before when I had get out of debt, uh, see things just come out the last 10 years into an escalation because I understood the key to economic independence. And then God began to show me how to steward well the money I had, start with whatever I had in my hand and then begin to steward it well. Why am I telling you this? Because some of you might be here thinking, um, well, it's great for Pastor Matthew and Pastor Ruben to talk uh, because they've got it now, but we don't have anything to start with. Or you might be uh, here saying, well, I've had things, but I'm I've crashed. I don't know what to do. Or you might say, uh, yeah, look, I do have some money. I do, uh, what do I do next? But whatever journey you're in, we, we, we've been in those positions. And we, we, whatever we're telling you is that you can, you've got to start at a point of what does the Bible say and look at principles from that and begin to build. And the, the, the key is economic independence. The second key is having a permanent financial breakthrough, not just a breakthrough. And I talk about that in the book, uh, Better Than Tides. It sets a foundation of saying that we need to understand that tithing doesn't get us, it gets us into the roller coasters because we have a wrong identity. You know, Padre Bruce is here today and he spoke amazingly at the conference on identity. And he's got his book that's, you know, uh, uh, ready, to be, ready to be out in hard copy soon. And he's got his PDF to release soon. But that identity is the, is the master key to all of the stuff that we do. When we know who we are, we begin to step forward from that point. So, uh, let me just delete this and give me a second as, ooh, my computer is deciding to crash on me. So, uh, that's a first for an apple. <laughs> I've got the circle of, ooh, it recovered. That's a normal thing that happens to an apple. <laughs> Can you guys still see my share screen? You can. All right, let me just put this on. Thank God Matthew's not mute, unmuted. He would be saying something now. Um, so, you know, Papa Luke's talked about this a few times, um, about the reset. And it's really important that we really take note of this, that it is a season, 2020 is a season of resetting. And part of why you're here today, and I really appreciate, you know, we don't take it for granted. We're celebrating. Matthew and I celebrated um, that so many people are finally in the church getting ready to say, I need a change in my financial side, side of things and that I'm not afraid to look at it. And that's, that's really powerful. So it's time to reset. And that's really important. I want you to think through what reset means because resetting means that we change the habits that we do, but based around truths. Okay, just like an, a truth is this. Um, repentance is not turning away from sin. Repentance is turning to Jesus. Because you can turn away from sin, but it doesn't mean you've turned to Jesus, right? 
But when we say we've repented, it's actually we're turning to Jesus. And when I turn to Jesus, it's changing your mind, metanoia. But when I repent as a believer, it means that I'm turning to Jesus. And when I turn to him, it means I've left sin. But just because if I say I've turned away from sin doesn't mean I've left, I've turned to Jesus. Does that make sense? And so there are things in our lives where we've, we've thought that we're doing the, the right way financially and wealth building wise, and it isn't. And it's time for us to change. And if out of this few minutes that I have with you guys um, here, if we can just give you some ideas and around those ideas, build some practical, put some principles and practical together, then you, know, you have something to start with. So this scripture here, John 3, 3 John 1, 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. Um, that scripture is a really powerful scripture because it doesn't say even as your spirit prospers. It says even as your soul prospers. Your soul is made up of your mind and your emotions. And so let me put to you that you will prosper. And this word prosper does mean financially as well. You will prosper to the level of your mind. you will prosper to the level of your mind. So if you can become a student of investments and think kingdom wealth wise, you will prosper to the level of your mind. And that's really important. So today is all about sorting out the mind. Here's a question for you. Do you have weak thinking or wealth thinking? You can't have both. I want you to think about that. Do you have weak thinking or wealth thinking? Are you thinking from the world's perspective of what's happening even with COVID and other things and economic situations? Or are you thinking from the position of heaven and how heaven sees this? How many of you realize that heaven is not, uh, in even in for, for, for a moment, heaven has not hesitated, hesitated and said, we didn't see this coming. It knows this and it knows what the next, eruption of economic doom is ahead, right? So that's why I, I found the key to all of my issues was first to step into economic independence. And economic independence is based around Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everything is added to you. Papa Luke spoke about that during the conference. And if you were not there, you've forgotten it, you can go on my YouTube channel and you can check out the, 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 the videos there on, on the teachings. Um, you've got the raw footage there of you know, six hours of, of teaching um, over two, two, two sections. And it's, it's that putting that perspective in mind, when I seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, everything begins added, starts adding to me. Now we believe that scripture, but we don't live it because we really don't believe it. Why? Because doubt and fear override it. In, in Genesis 26, it talks about Isaac sowing in the land. And it says, he began to prosper, continued to prosper, and it became very prosperous indeed. And the Lord showed me this, that it was a journey of going from broke to a permanent breakthrough into flow and overflow in your finances. And you can apply this in every area of your life, but I'm applying it in our finances. And so the, the, when you start walking in the covenant of Abraham that Jesus came and reestablished, what I've discovered is, that I'm getting to this place where I went out of broke into a permanent breakthrough for the first time. And over 10 years, I've never looked back and gone back because I've applied the principles of what the Bible says and, and, and the covenant that God made with himself, that in blessing, I will bless you. And when you understand that, things start to flow in a way like you've never seen before. Because you start faithing it till you make it. And then you start seeing results and you don't have to have faith anymore in it because it's, 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 it's evidence. And then you move to the next stage of faithing something till you make it. And then you keep growing in what Matthew calls growing in capacity. Amen. So you start with what's in your hand. God said to Moses, what's in your hand? He said, a staff. He said, it's more than a staff. I mean, it's a staff without me, but with me, it's more than that, right? Throw it on the ground, see what happens. Um, how can I go rescue people with this staff against Pharaoh's army? It's more than a staff. What do you have in your hand? And I've learned to start business from nothing. And it is very possible to do. And I'll share that more in a few minutes. Moving from breakthrough to flow, the flow stage is a really important stage where I have discovered that most people um, 
can live on a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars a year USD. If you agree with that, that if you had an income of a hundred to two hundred thousand USD a year and you had no, all your debts paid off, so you had no debts and you had an income of a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars a year, your only ongoing costs and expenses are your living expenses. How many of you would agree that that would be sufficient for you to live off? And you'd be not just in a breakthrough mode, but you'd be in a flow mode. You'd be pretty comfortable. You could give away. You could live. So no debt. You don't have a mortgage. You don't have any credit card debts. There's no ongoing debts. All debts cleared. And this is a realistic place to be in. Trust me that it's possible to get there. If you would agree with that, I want you to just type a yes in the in 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 the screen in the chat box. That a hundred to two hundred thousand USD a year is quite possible. And there's a reason why I'm asking these questions, because sometimes we just say, I want to be a millionaire. And as Matthew often says, I'm not a millionaire, but I'm very comfortable in living because you don't need. There was a time when I was living on less than, four, I think, 30 or $40,000 uh, Australian, which is about 15, 20, 20 USD with a family with, with nine children. And I was still able to give beyond myself because I had absolutely canceled my debts to zero. Right. Thank you for, for those who are, who are responding. If, if $100,000 to $200,000 is enough, and, and one of the journeys that we want to en encourage you on, and after we finish this program, we, we, there's an opportunity if you want to continue a journey with us in a paid program for four weeks that we'd like to share with people uh, that we're starting on Thursday. We've already got people in there, and if you want to be part of that, you're most welcome to, but th there is no obligation for that. This is just an opportunity for you is that there's actually these details and it's growth, but it's an absolute change of mindset to be able to say, can I make $100,000 to $200,000 a year? We've got actual plans that we've tested out that are possible to do those things. And, and then here's the exciting thing. The overflow is that you can then grow in capacity to making a million dollars a year income. But here's the thing that's exciting. Here's where the prosperity preachers got it wrong and they, and they missed the, the, the word of God. If I have set how much I need to live on and I start now growing my capacity because I can steward it better because the Bible says when we're faithful in the little, he'll give us more, right? Amen. If I start now being able to grow a capacity of a million dollar income, some of you will say, I don't need it. Well, it's not up to you, mate. It's up to what heaven has endorsed into your hands, right? Others of you will say, I'll, over, I'll spend and spend it on your... But if you've set $100,000, $200,000 a year, you could give away 80 to 90%, which is why I say, why give away? Why, why is 10% tides even a, it's not even a, a blip on the screen anymore for us? Because Jesus gave 100% of himself. Everything belongs to the Lord. At the flow level, we're already giving away 40%, 50% of our income, sometimes even more than that. Why? Because it's, it belongs to him. And the more we give, the more we get. And we don't give to get, but we give because we've got doesn't make sense, right? And so when you now start moving into an overflow mode, which is I haven't got there yet, but I'm getting towards that place. And it's really exciting is I don't have to change how much money I use. What changes is how much money I give away for the kingdom. Amen. Um, our our nonprofit organization is actually a not-for-profit organization. It's not nonprofit. Why? Because it actually produces income in itself. And the profits of it are not distributed to any of us. They're used for helping feeding the children and feeding the orphans, et cetera. Now that's exciting because most nonprofit organizations get funding from outside. How exciting is it that Project 61 is able to actually fund itself and not depend entirely on anyone who wants to bless it from outside? Here's another exciting thing where we're getting to a point where I have this vision with Papa Luke. He's the president of Project 61. I'm the vice and um, Matthew is a secretary, uh, not secretary, the treasurer, sorry. Um, he's the money man. But how exciting is it that we were thinking if we had a, when we get a, a, a place of a million dollars of capital that we could invest in Project 61 and produce 30% interest from that, which we have avenues now that give us that sort of returns, um, that's $300,000 a year. What could we do with that money? Are you getting what I'm saying? And still preserve the capital. Can you see how kingdom can focus when you go back to your flow and go, yes. And that's why I asked you to agree or disagree 
and a yes if you're agreeing that 100 to 200,000 USD is more than enough for you to live off comfortably. Because now you have something that you can set your sights on and then you can move up from there to start doing that while you're doing the flow and giving, now you're increasing for, for kingdom capacity. So here's the, the question that's so important that I want you to keep thinking about. Can my income produce without me? Because most people say that they're earning a lot of money, but the moment they stop working, their income stops producing. A lot of people who say they're, they're business owners, but they're not, they're self-employed. Take yourself out of the business and the money stops coming in. So can my money produce without me? Now, I'm not a financial planner. I'm not a, I can't give you financial advice. I can't give you um, accounting advice, but I'm just sharing my story. Okay, and that's really important. Here's one of my stories that uh, earlier this month, I, I got a message from, and a few of us got this message who are on here that are part of this platform. We had distributions of profits over the weekend, and this is just during the COVID time, 7th of April, of 3.9%, 6.9%, and 5.84%. This is over a five-week period. Multiply this by 10, and you will know how much profit that our investments are making. That's uh, Normally, we, we expect a, a 20 to 40% return in this platform. We're making that, that, that's, that's outstanding during COVID. This came, this is, this is just over this weekend where the principal uh, profit was $2.28 million and, and our investments returned at 3.34%. Multiplied by 10 and you, you get to see how much profits where money's producing after its, its own kind. Is anyone in, excited with those sort of things? You know, these are things that are real that tested. Now you've got to take your own risks and your own owners. So each one of us do, but there's real th platforms that are actually out there that are working for us. And as Matthew said, we don't put all our money into these things, but we put a certain percentage. And then we have what we call a, a, a low risk in the high risk category and we see it perform. So I want to just talk for a few minutes about something Matthew touched on briefly at the conference, seven rights and responsibilities to create wealth. I want to put this biblically in perspective because this is a foundation. If you get this foundation right, it's like a wise man who builds his house upon a rock. And when the storms come and the rock is the word of God, his house will not be shaken. There will be storms, but if we build wisely, then we can build confidently. So number one, it is your God-given right and responsibilities to create wealth. Deuteronomy 8.18, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to create wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Number two, your God-given rights and responsibilities to live debt-free. See, that's in the Bible. So as much as I was growing up in Australia, and a lot of similar countries are similar nowadays, where it's okay to have debt, credit card debt, uh, mortgage, house debt, car debts, etc. cetera, um, God's uh, word and promise to us is that we should live debt-free. It's our responsibility and our right. So I applied this scripture in Romans 13, 8, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt of love. And I used that to get out of my $200,000 worth of debt. Story for another time, but amazing stories of how God either canceled my debt or gave me the ability to pay it off when it seemed so impossible. Number three, three, it is your God-given rights and responsibilities not to be poor. Deuteronomy 15, four. Number four, it is your God-given rights and responsibilities to lend and not borrow. Very different from what society has groomed us in. Can you see that it's important? We said, you know, beloved, I, I, I pray that you prosper to the level that your soul prospers. You can only prosper to the level that your mind and your thinking is. And if you think it's okay because society has said it's okay to borrow and not lend, then you've, you've shortchanged what God has intended for you and how you were designed to be. And if you say, well, I don't borrow, but I don't lend either, then you still shortchanged yourself. What a blessing it is to be able to lend to nations. That's exciting. Something Matthew and I are looking forward to, right, bro? 
<laughs> you know, lending to nations. How amazing. Have our own bank. Papa Luke's always talked about that he's seen us having our own bank. Why? Why not? Number six. Uh, sorry, this is number five. I, I've swapped the slides around accidentally. It is your God-given rights and responsibilities to help the widow, orphans, fatherless, and the needy. James 1 verse 27, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God, the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. You know, you, we, just stop saying, I'll wait till I have money to give. If you can give a dollar, give a dollar. If you can give uh, a rupee, give a rupee. If you can give a shilling, give a shilling. If you can give, give a kobo, give a kobo. Uh, don't wait till you get hundreds because if you can't give when you have one or two, you'll never give when you have hundreds or millions. Because bad habits will always continue. Change your habits and all of a sudden everything in life starts to change. Amen or me. <laughs> Number six. It is your God-given rights and responsibilities to be a good steward of money. Not a servant of money, but a good steward. Here's the lesson. Use worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. And if you're faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things... So if you're not faithful with the things of mammon, with the things of money, the worldly resources, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities, the value of souls. If you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? Now you know why the, the, as a church we've fared poorly because we've not been trustworthy with the lowest common denominator of money. But here's the good news. We're changing that around. We're turning it around. And we're starting to be faithful with the little and God just increasing and we're faithful with the increase and is increasing and we're faithful and those things even when I, even when we're earning millions and billions of dollars through us that's still considered the smallest little things because the big things are the souls of heaven amen number seven it is your god-given rights and responsibilities to be time free resource and available to fulfill the great commission 2 corinthians 5 18 to 20 So here are the seven, in a nutshell, you'll recognize it's similar to what Matthew put up over the weekend. I want you to have a look at that for a moment. These are the seven we just talked through as your rights and responsibilities. I want you to remember these are your royal rights and responsibilities as sons of the king. You're not just sons, you're royal sons. You're not just the bride, you're the royal bride. Amen. And I want you to look at them and I want you to, to, to look at it and, and I'd like you to put this in, your, in the chat. What's one of these seven things that you can celebrate that you're doing. One of these seven things that go, yep, yeah, I can celebrate that this is my right and responsibility and I'm actually doing this. And then I want you to put what's one that's challenging to you. What's challenging you in these So if you we put that in the chat, two numbers. What's The first number will be what you're celebrating that I am doing. And the other one is what's one thing, and there might be more than one in each category, but I just want you to do one. So you'll be writing two numbers in, your, in the chat. And the second number is quite important. What's challenging you? I need to do this. This is new to me. This makes sense. I need to, I need to step into this. one person who's responded thank you love to hear from the others there's just exercises to help us think through um because change comes from repentance is a change of mind and 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 repentance not from sin but repentance into the kingdom mindsets when jesus said repent for the kingdom of god is at hand and thank you for those who are writing yeah, it just seems interesting that seven seems to be a challenge for a lot of people and and that's interesting you know, but it's good that you're picking that up and thank you. And, and let's celebrate the ones that you're going, yep, I can celebrate this. I, I get this and I can celebrate this. I'm just going to move on to the next screen just because I'm wary of time and I, I want to honor the time that we have. So why do I talk about uh, finances so much? 
it, it's it's a means to an end. It's it's not a me. It's not an end in itself. Uh, our hearts are the value of a soul that none should perish. Here's an example. Just recently, a um, few months back, just just towards the end of last year, we were. I, I was invited to Sydney to be a speaker at a at a business conference where we had businessmen and women come from different parts of the country in Australia to Sydney. And we had about, I think, four or 500 plus people in there. And I was invited as one of the speakers. And, and um, when we came the night before the conference started, we were having dinner together with a few of the pastors um, and businesswomen. This is a businesswoman, Michelle, who has been one of my students as well uh, after, this, uh, after that meeting. And there's another pastor down here who's a lawyer and a pastor, another minister. And there was this lady called Wendy, a beautiful girl who looks so drained out. This is not how she looked when we first met her, having dinner with us uh, the night before the conference. And we worked out, we hadn't realized that she wasn't a believer. And she was a, had a Buddhist background and she was the caretaker of the venue. And so when people realized that they started to try and pounce on her and tell her how bad Buddha was. And it was really a bit annoying to me because for those who know me, you know that it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance, not condemning them about where they're going. So I speak, so began to speak to Wendy and um, she just looked at me and my big smile and said, you know, there's, there's this energy about you that's so good. Now I get, she's coming from a Buddhist background. So I said to her, I'd love to introduce you to the, the, the highest level of energy that you'll ever meet. And I said, give me your hand. And the pastors around me and the business Christian businessmen around me and women looked at me a little bit strangely thinking, am I really saved or not? Because I'm talking a language that she understood, but they were feeling it's not Christianese. And, and I held her hand and her face changed. And she goes, I feel the energy. And I go, this energy is actually a person and his name is the Holy Spirit. And I, he wants to introduce you to Jesus. Within a few hours, she had given her heart to the Lord. The value of a soul. I might have gone there for a business meeting and acquired some clients from that in business and helped them uh, with getting their dreams moving forward. But this was the highlight for me in that trip. The next day, this is Wendy, and this is my son and daughter, two out of my nine. And um, uh, they move in the prophetic as well because we teach them. This Saturday, we'll be doing that again, running that teaching course. Um, Wendy invite, uh, introduced me to this lady and she comes from a Muslim background and here's my big smile again and, and our, our smiles and she, Wendy's all excited now God's doing something in her life and so asked me to speak to her friend speak to her friend a few hours later she's given her heart to the Lord it's not hard when we live out what we believe and we put people first so the reason we do all of this is to free up our time to do what God's called us to do this is a couple of years ago, 2017. Picture's a bit dark, I do apologize. This is 31st night in Melbourne City. And these are all a bunch of believers who got together in Australia. We're all Aussies here. Um, and we come together in the city and, uh, and we go out and just the value of a soul for, from seven to just before midnight, we'll go giving people an opportunity to, to receive a new heart and a new start in Christ. That's my beautiful wife on the right. And our two children, they came out with us as well. It was a beautiful summer's night. That particular year, we saw 244 uh, people give their hearts to the Lord in, a, in just a three to four hour bracket. The value of a soul that none should perish. Just to put it into perspective of why we do what we do. This is my uncle, um, my dad's best friend in Canada. A couple of years ago, his daughter called us. We grew up with him in Nigeria um, and, and I hadn't seen him for over 30 years. Um, his daughter called us, said he's in a nursing home, he's fallen. They said he won't live much. He has not much longer to live. And um, the daughter had given her heart to Jesus, which was a miracle in itself. He, this man comes from a Hindu background. And the daughter was crying to us and saying, uh, I, you know, my mom refused to accept Jesus. She died of, from cancer and I won't see her again. And I don't want the same to happen to my dad. And, and so our, our, heart has always been that God, even for the sake of one soul, we'll travel even to the other side of the world. So I talked to my mom and my sister and my wife, and we made an agreement and I booked my ticket to Canada, which took a, you know, it's, it's a long journey. It's a 16, 20, 16 plus another three hours or four hours journey. It's quite a long journey to go there. And uh, went there, met this man who was a staunch, you got to understand he's an 80s staunch uh, Buddhist, uh, sorry, Hindu background, 
would get really angry, has a really bad temper, and would get really angry if you ever talk, anyone talked about Jesus to him. I went and saw him. It took me a little while to convince him that after 30 years, I do have hair on my face, and it's quite normal to, to grow up um, and to convince him who I was. And this was him the first day that I met him, went and saw him the, the few days I was there, and, and he gave his heart to Jesus. Do you see the difference? Same camera angle, same daylight. I did not doctor these. I didn't even realize until I put the pictures together one day and I burst out into tears because we forget sometimes the power of the Holy Spirit and what Jesus can actually do to transform us. And this blew me away. And he's still alive. He's, in, he's recovered. He's not kicking the bucket like he said he was going to. And he's, uh, he's slowly being discipled into the way of a believer. Hallelujah. How awesome is that? So <clears throat> how do we start? These are the way, this is the way I started with my wealth steps. Number one, I changed my mind towards wealth. Number two, I started with faith because I had nothing. When I lost everything, I started with nothing, literally minus $200,000 in debt. And, and I want to encourage you, you can do the same. Number three, create a plan to produce income without capital. Is it possible to make money from nothing? Yes, it is. I've done it over seven times. It is very possible. And I've taught others to do it around the world. Number four, use your capital. If you do have capital, use your capital to invest into a mentor. Why? Because it's so much quicker and so much faster to get there. Number five, make money, produce money by investing a portion of your savings in high-risk categories that are low-risk. Make money, have children, guys. In other words, if we were created to multiply, then we should also cause the same thing to happen with money. It must produce its own kind without us being involved. Number six, don't buy negative geared properties. Buy positive cash flow properties. Buy properties that will produce income, not put you into more debt. Number seven, make your house pay for its own mortgage. Mine pays for my own mortgage. It's the only reason why I, I, I recently moved into a new place because the Lord directed us to so we could have a bigger place for home church and for some of the other stuff that we're doing from a kingdom perspective. But I refused to do that until I found a way that my previous house could pay for this one. And so I increased my rental through strategies that God's taught me fourfold from what the agent proposed the rental would be. And that pays for itself. So there's no burden on myself. So I can continue to do what God's called me to do. Is that good? Or is that good? These are all strategies that God's taught us and taught me through Deuteronomy 818. Number eight, and these are not in this sequence necessarily when we get to this, this section is give, 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 so, so, so these are the steps I've taken. Always giving, always sowing. Everything belongs to him, not 10%. Number nine, Move into wealth creation that produces double, five, 10, 30, 60, 100 fold. Stop just looking at percentages and percentage increases. Those are our minimums. That's what the parables of the talents, the parables of the soil, and the parables of the miners teach us. Build with the mind to give away 80 to 90% of your income and live on 10 to 20%, which would be more than enough. I don't know if any of you are excited about that, but I am. Is it possible? Absolutely. Have you anyone heard of Colgate toothpaste? Um, you know, William Colgate, over nearly 150 years ago, I think now it is, possibly close to 200 years ago, um, had, a, had a vision for Colgate. He was making soaps at that time, and, and toothpaste wasn't on top of his list, but it has now become to the toothpaste. Um, he would give away 10% of his income and live on 90 and that was too much money for him. He started giving away 20%, lived on 80%, that was too much for him. Uh, started giving away 30%, living on 70% of his income, that was too much for him. Before he died, he was giving away over 90% of his income, living on 10% and that was too much money for him. Is that a good problem to have? Absolutely. I was in a remote part of India a few years ago, ministering there and I'd run out of toothpaste and I asked the, the, the one who was hosting me, whether he would get some toothpaste for me. And guess what he got me? Colgate. It was in the remote part of, of India. It's everywhere. But see, God has this ability to multiply what we have when we, everything belongs to him. And that attitude is one of the biggest attitudes that we need to change. 
So here's my three Here's my three principles I work on currently in producing wealth. Make money from nothing. Make money, make money. And make my investments multiply as a minimum twofold. So for every $1,000 I put in, I expect 2,000 back. Minimum. 5, 10, 30, 60, 100 fold. I'm shooting more for 30, 30 60 right now. Every 1,000 I put in as an investment, I expect 30,000, 60,000, 100,000 back. See, no more percentages. But we talked about percentages before because that's the bare minimum that Jesus said to the, the servant who said, I hid the money. He said, you should have at least put it in the bank. See, all, the, all of this is in the Bible. We just don't know how to fully understand it. So these are my wealth steps. And I want you for a few minutes just to look at them and, and look at which one really speaks to you that could be your next step move. Perhaps you can identify with some of these steps. And I want you to think of... Where are you right now in which step and what, what could be your next step that you can move to? And if, and if you can just put, put that in the chat, um, what's the next step you could take? Now, what's one of these steps that now say, yep, yeah, I, I think I can take the next one. Because sometimes we're, we're so overwhelmed with all the steps. And it might be that you're just starting just to start with one, step one. Might be that you're down the track a little bit. Thank you, uh, Tim and Claudia, for starting. You know, just start, go to... If you're, if you're fair, way, we're fair way down the track, it might be step nine. Thank you, Valerie and Julius. These are important, guys. This step, this part is really important. Because it'll help you do what we promised you we would do today, which is give you some really practical ways you can take to move to the next stage. So I'm going to take a few minutes to... As I finish off the presentation, what's the next step for you? Yeah, that's good. Some of you are three, four, five. Some of you are eight, one, and three. You know, I'll give. If you haven't taken a picture of this slide, please take a picture of it. Matthew, somebody did ask if we could have the slides available to people. I'm happy to have my slides available. You're okay with that? Yeah. We'll have to work out how we can. We probably can email it to you guys. Email the slides to you. So we'll get that done in the next few days, and we'll send you the link as well to this video. See, this can, you just, can you just explain a bit more what number four means? Use your capital to invest into a mentor. I don't know what that means. Okay. So um, I find somebody who's gone in a place that I, I want to go to. So it could be in business or it could be in property or it could be in, uh, in passive income of some sort. And I get him or her to teach me what they've done. And I invest in them by paying them rather than putting my money into investing into a capital in business. And what I've discovered is if I do that, I start my business without capital, but I invest in a mentor who's gone ahead and been successful. And I have a better chance of being successful than trying to do it on my own and spending lots of money and not knowing where I'm going. Make sense? So that has been a, one of my biggest uh, helps. I must say it's been hard finding mentors because most people don't want to share their successes until it's been dried up. And one thing I love about Matthew and myself is that we will share everything currently that's happening to us to help you with, that we've tested out. And if we haven't tested it, we'll tell you we haven't tested it. But it's then up to you to take the risk or the decision that you want to make. But it lowers your risk when you have others around you that are helping you. Thank you for those who are putting this in, putting down the next step. That's really important. Because the Holy Spirit's all over this and, and the ability for you to move forward. And I'd suggest you to take a, a picture of this because this is something for the rest of the year, if you would focus on from your wealth perspective, it'll make a big, it'll make a big help. Because when you then look at, okay, what, how do I start creating a plan, for example, step three to produce income without capital, you can then start looking at what I've taught you on the other slides, what Matthew has taught you through the sessions. And this alone could propel you into your financial breakthroughs. It is quite possible. Wow, what a blessing. 
sorry for me just being a little bit quiet because there's a really powerful presence of the Lord again. That's when it happens, I just have to, I gotta be a bit quiet <laughs> because, you know, it's great when heaven's clapping into some of the stuff that's being taught. And it's really exciting to see ambassadors here today, people who are really wanting to, to grab this and stop allowing the systems of this world to dictate to them and start making a difference. So we have, um, you know, we have come to the end of our sessions. I, I'm happy to stay on with Matthew and answer any questions if you have. Secondly, we would like to, um, so we do that for about five minutes, maybe 10 minutes max. Um, and then I'd like to, if anyone's interested to know a bit more about the, um, the program that we have starting on Thursday, um, it, it is an opportunity, it is a paid opportunity. And the reason we pay is not because we need the money. It's simply because we've recognized that when people commit uh, like the good soils, it's what we call being ready and committed, is that the, when you put money into a, into a decision, um, you actually turn up. And um, so if you're interested to know the next four weeks, how, uh, more about how Matthew and I are actually going into taking these things into, bigger, into more detail with a small class of people and actually helping them journey, then you're welcome to stay back for, and it'll be about five minutes that we'll tell you about that. And then if anyone needs any prayer ministry or prophetic words, more than happy to, uh, uh, to help out with that as well. So any questions right now? Can you elaborate on number six, buy positive cash flow properties? Yeah, that's a great question, Marge. Um, so basically, um, I don't know what, if you have this in Malaysia, because I think most people here are from Australia, Malaysia, and I know a couple of people, one person's from Nigeria, physically in Nigeria, but in Australia, we have what is called negative gearing properties. Uh, does any, do, is that Robert, This yeah. is quite unique to Australia. It's unique to Australia. All right. In Malaysia, is it, do you guys lose money on your properties while you're waiting for capital growth? If you buy investment properties or is everyone just positive cash flow? Everyone's quiet. Matthew, what happens when in Malaysia when you buy? I haven't bought in Malaysia yet. Well, I, when I was there, it was, uh, it depends on the type of property and the location. So, you know, if the rental is good, then it, you do get the positive cash flow in the sense that it, you, you pay off and you still get some profits. Yeah. Otherwise, if you're looking as a long term, then you, you, you know, you still, it comes like what we're doing here, negative cash flow. But the thing is there, you cannot offset your income tax. Can't offset it, correct. So in Australia, we have... A so you're saying it's you can rent it out for more than you're paying the mortgage. Is that basically what you're saying? That's mortgage what positive cash flow is. Your mortgage and all other expenses, correct. So okay. you have positive cash flow at the end, not a negative. In Australia, the accountants tend to tell us to, to buy negative geared property. So where at the end of it, you have uh, a debt owing more than a positive because you can offset your, um, your tax bill. Right, and that's the worst thing possible. But most countries, there's usually, you know, uh, your 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 rental is normally about two to three percent less than whatever the loan rate is, and all your expenses put together. All right. So cash flow properties is I found a way about twenty years ago. I started doing this where I would rent out properties strategically, and I had about two or three strategies that I would use. Where I'd either rent it out room by room, I'd fully furnish it. I would. Uh, do something a little bit different that others hadn't done. And I was able to get anywhere between 30% to 200% more income generated from that property than if I had just done a standard renting it out. And that produced pro positive cash flow where it paid off for the loan and all the expenses and gave me a little bit more and had capital growth on it as well. So one example was I bought a property for $300,000 in a time when everyone said, don't buy, it's too expensive, so on. When people ask me, when's the best time to buy a property? I say, now. it's always a good time to buy. It just depends on how you buy it. And whenever you buy it, buy it with your profit in mind from the beginning. Um, within three years, I had not just from the beginning positive cash flowed it because I made it into a five bedroom and it was a four bedroom. And um, it was very comfortable. And I had, uh, I had about 150% more rental than I got through an agent. And then within three years, I also had capital growth of another $300,000. So it went up to $600,000 and I made a $300,000 profit. Is that good or is that good? That's pretty good. Okay. Um, so there are strategies like that, which is why we call positive cash flow. All right. Um, but I hope that helps. Great question. Any other questions? Uh, Julius, I'd like to know more about your courses and if you'll be touching on different types of investing example trading. Uh, yes. So in the four week 
course, which I will tell you in a couple of minutes time about it, um, it, it will be touching on actual, some of the things that we actually do as well. Um, we had to set foundations here and give you some of the strategies and, and we're not holding anything back. We're not waiting for you to uh, say, tell us more. We just wanna see if this is in, enough for you to get started. If you feel like you're ready to go on a, a more accelerated journey, Matthew and I are putting, have put together a ridiculous, I think he's, he's just done a ridiculous amount of an offer, which is great. And, and it's to help get you guys doing something, taking action. Any other questions or comments for either myself or Matthew? Okay, I, I've got a, I've got a question that I was I've been dying to ask all evening, so <laughs> I'll ask it. Why are you dying? Dying to ask it. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, one way or another, I I have been involved in some investments for many many years now, and I have never seen anything at thirty percent that wasn't hugely hugely risky. Um, because usually risk and return, you know, they go hand in hand, right? So high returns, high risk. Anything that is kind of like even reasonable risk, maybe 10%, maybe at best 12%, maybe 15 if you're, depending on what the markets are doing and all those sorts of things. So I, I just, I, I can't get my head around even thinking about the, you know, investing and, and like Matthew's example, that year after year after year after year after year after year, you could be gaining 30%, 30%, 30%, 30%, 30%, 30%. Yep. So um, if you can't get that, you're not going to even get the fact that we get multiple returns yeah. by starting business without capital. How do, you, how do we explain that? Because literally there's nothing put down and we're making hundreds, tens of thousands of dollars coming in without any capital and what, what sort of returns are they? Not even 30% returns now, they're multiplication, right? But to answer your question, it's a very good question. So yes, it is a high risk, but people have chosen to say high risk, low risk, because that's what the banks teach you. That's what the financial systems of the world teach us. There's high risk and low risk. Actually in the high risk category, if you wanna be rich, you have to take risks. But in the high risk category, if you take low risks, in the high risk category, then you have, you, what you've done is you've had a look at the um, characteristics of the traders or the, or the people who are making the money for you or the business that you're going into. And then you take decisions on that. If you take a high risk out of a high, with a high risk, that means you're gambling. So that's why we take a small percentage of our savings. And Matthew alluded to that and said, you know, 15%, anywhere between five to 20% what I kind of say. Yeah, and, and if I may add to what Ruben is saying, it's uh, every investment, uh, John, is there is risk, whether it's, a, whether it's a 5% return or a 30% return, there's every one of them has got a risk, right? Sure. But sure. it is about you understanding what that risk is and managing that risk. If you know how to manage the risk, it is becomes a, either high risk becomes a low risk or medium risk. Yeah. So... This particular thing that we, we've talked about is just one of many, like we know two that are giving back 30% returns. Yes. Now, uh, our risk is that we could lose all our money, but this is on one side of the scale. All the positives bring down our risk of losing all the money because we found that people for seven years in, this, in one particular one has never lost any money. And, and, uh, further, to, yeah, and further to what Ruben is saying, in this particular investment, there are six different fund man funds, right? So what we don't put all our eggs in one fund, even though we're only putting 15% of our total investment there, we spread that even to the other six, into those six funds. Correct, it's distributed. So it's another level of uh, risk management, mm -hmm. right? So even if one gets affected, you're not affected by every one of them. Okay? Brilliant so, question. Yeah. Um, and, and, and 